as it turns out, this will be just part one um, of the presentation. What I would like to do is give a quick introduction to myself, who I am, just so that you have a, a rough idea. Ideally, if I mean, if it's inter in interactive, that would also be helpful. If there's anything that I'm talking about that you want clarification on, that you want to ask any questions about, please feel free to uh, butt in and ask me before we move on to the next topic. Uh, so, so yeah, I'll, I'll let me just get this started. Right. So a bit of background about myself, for those of you who don't know me or haven't come across me, my name's Elliot. I am not a medical doctor. I'm a nutritionist. I'm originally from the UK, but now I am living in France. I founded a, a company called EO Nutrition. I was working with uh, clients uh, from a nutritional basis. I did some training in what's called functional medicine, which I'd imagine that a couple of you or some of you may be familiar with. Uh, basically, this concept of using uh, nutrients as medicine, essentially, uh, I have a particular interest in the orthomolecular approach. And I also have a YouTube channel. That's how most people find me. They come across my work. Uh, that is EO Nutrition. And I tend to make a lot of videos on uh, this one particular topic that we're going to speak about today. And I hope that by the end of it, you will also share some of my enthusiasm and passion for this subject because it is extremely overlooked. Barely anyone knows about it, particularly in the alternative medicine field. Practically no one talks about this. There are really a handful of us, but when you begin applying this clinically, if you're working with patients, you're working with clients, you begin uh, actually putting this stuff into practice, you will witness some miracles. Uh, and it is not necessarily something that works for everyone, but it certainly does work for a lot more people than you would imagine. So uh, just a bit of background, I have been using this therapy, HDT is an abbreviation for high dose thiamine, thiamine, vitamin B1, which we'll look at. I've been doing this since 2018. Um, I published some protocols, which is basically like a an ebook, a PDF, uh, laying out kind of how, how to go about this. A lot of practitioners use this, but also many people who are just doing it for themselves and the idea was to put everything that I kind of learned in those five years down onto paper so that people could start doing it themselves. And so almost 2,000 people have been, have been using that. I run a, a Facebook group, a support group on, uh, on Facebook. This is for people who uh, use this therapy. They want to ask questions. I don't practice anymore, so I don't see people in person uh, simply because I feel as though my, um, my strengths are trying to educate and make content. And, and that's a way to get to the wider population rather than uh, most of my time tied up with individuals. Um, but the idea is, but also my, my aim is to ra raise as much awareness of this therapy as possible, because I know that it's uh, it's really something that, that is, is, is super useful. So yeah, uh, here's a, a disclaimer, and it is a conflict of interest. I need to let you know before we go into this discussion. I did in 2019, I did found a company called Objective Nutrients. And of course, we manufacture thiamine-based supplements. Now, a lot of people will come to me and say, well, of course, you're going to talk about the benefits of thiamine if you own a company that makes thiamine. And here's the, really the most important point that I want to get across to everyone. The brand of thiamine that, that is used is really irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Any brand will work. Um, what is most important is the form. And there are a couple of different forms available. And the forms that will work for one person won't necessarily work for another person. But ultimately, if 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 someone is using the right form, if they're using the right dose, it doesn't matter where you get it from. Uh, ironically, the reason why I started the company was because I, I saw that it was working and you know this particular uh, form that I wanted wasn't available uh, in the country that I was living in. So, But just to get that out of the way. So to start off with, um, I would imagine that most of you, if you've had uh, training in biochemistry or just basic uh, medical science, then you will have learned the basics of nutrition. And I'm not going to go through uh, all of that in depth because that is freely available online wherever you look. But just for a basic recap, what thiamine is, it's, it's one of the B-class vitamins. It was the first B vitamin to be isolated and discovered. Um, and it is also known as vitamin B1. So it's really quite ubiquitous in foods. You can find it in most foods when we're talking about whole foods. Uh, the highest foods I've listed here, um, but generally it's, it's, it's pretty freely available in most of the things that you're going to be finding uh, as long as they are whole and not proce processed. Now, uh, Barry Berry literally translates to, uh, sorry, to give some context, Barry Berry is the classical deficiency syndrome. So when someone becomes deficient, they, they lack this vitamin. Um, the, the first term given for that was Barry Berry, and it translates to, I can't, I can't. Now, it was originally discovered, I say originally discovered, it has been known uh, perhaps for th uh, a couple of thousand years, at least in China, something uh, that they identified, but they never really understood. It was identified in Japan. W what was happening was you had this class division, the higher classes. Of course, Japan for a long time has relied on rice as a staple in the diet. And what you would find was that the higher classes were they developed ways to polish the rice. In other words, uh, remove the bran, remove the husk, 
and they started consuming high amounts of white rice. And it was among the people who were consuming white rice as a significant portion of the diet, they began to develop a strange collection of symptoms. And this was uh, a real problem for a very long time. It was only kind of by chance that they discovered that when you would consume rice uh, in its unpolished state, so brown rice, the people would, uh, they, they wouldn't develop these problems. And so it was eventually studied and, and in the in 1926, I believe they isolated it. And then in the 1930s, they actually found a way to synthesize it. After that, they began fortifying foods, fortifying rice, and they discovered that this essentially nullified the problem. Um, but Ultimately, when we're looking at what thiamine does in the body, and we'll go into some of the biochemistry in more detail shortly, very simple terms, uh, the main systems which are affected are going to be the brain. That is the most affected organ. Secondarily, it's going to be the heart. And thirdly, it's going to be the digestive system. Now, any, any condition which features dysfunction in any of these areas of the body um, could potentially respond to thiamine, and that's something that we'll also look at later. But essentially, um, so as they began studying uh, beriberi, they began studying thiamine deficiency on a population-wide sc wide scale. They discovered that there were it manifested in different ways for different people, and no one really understands why this is. In the Far East, it would tend to manifest in the cardiovascular system more often than not, whereas in the West, uh, it seemingly would more likely affect the central and the peripheral nervous system. And so you've got these different classifications of the same basic disease, which is which is caused by a thiamine deficiency, but it presents differently. So you have this presentation in the peripheral nervous system and the brain, this is known as dry berry berry. If any of you are medical doctors, you may have seen this in the emergency room, or you may have seen this in your patients, although it's considered quite rare, um, but this is generally going to be affecting the peripheral nerves. It can cause neuropathy. It can cause burning, tingling, painful sensations. It can cause... Um, uh, the, the symptoms essentially laid out on here are, are the way that you would, or the primary symptoms you will look for if you're going to diagnose this condition. On the other hand, like I was saying, you have this cardiovascular manifestation of this deficiency, and this is going to affect mainly the heart. It affects the um, peripheral blood vessels, and so you end up with uh, vasodilation, and this causes blood pooling, and uh, eventually can lead to high, high output heart failure. And all of these things together, they can be fatal if they're not detected early enough Although more often than not, I think they are detected when they get this severe. Um, what is another manifestation, which is not so commonly identified, at least, there's very few papers published on this, at least in the West. And this is the gut or the gastrointestinal manifestation of thiamine deficiency. And so, again, you see these, these symptoms, pain in the abdomen. Uh, severe na nausea, severe vomiting, and anorexia. People generally are losing weight. They can't put it on any weight. But again, this is quite a severe manifestation. So all of these things that we're looking at here, these are like the medical uh, definitions of the diagnosable thiamine deficiency uh, diseases. And ultimately, a uh, perhaps the most severe uh, brain manifestation is going to be a condition called Wernicke encephalopathy. Uh, it's thought as though this is going to present as a cl the classical triad. It's going to be confusion, ataxia, and ophthalmoplegia. Um, and it can, if it gets bad enough, uh, and at this point, if it does get this bad, then it's, it can be very difficult to treat. And it is often, more, more often than not, I believe, um, fatal. And at least the effects are going to be permanent to some extent. But this can manifest in Korsakoff psychosis. This is when the memory declines to such an extent that someone has almost complete amnesia, a confabulation, and it can progress into psychosis. So th these, these conditions that we're looking at, these are, are pretty well established. There's nothing unconventional about this. And this is what most medical practitioners will have learned at some point if they're going to be coming into contact with uh, this, this kind of thing. Uh, however, what I would say is that although it's considered to be rare, because it is, um, it's considered to be rare. However, the issue is, there does seem to be a, a problem with misdiagnosis or underdiagnosis. So there was one study which was looking at a post-mortem analysis. They were investigating um, an autopsy, the cause of death, and it found that 80% of the cases of Wernicke encephalopathy, they were missed. So for whatever reason, the doctors that were treating these patients were not either, either, either they did not see the signs or they did not think to measure Wernicke encephalopathy. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. But if we look at what they found, it's interesting, only 16% of the patients who had this, this, this problem, um, only 16% of them had the classical triad. And I believe that uh, you're taught that, okay, if you see these symptoms, it, someone has to have these symptoms or at least two of these symptoms to be diagnosed. And so there is a problem with uh, this being overlooked. And I think that that comes down to some pretty deeply rooted assumptions about 
this nu nutrient, and we'll get to that later. Um, but what I would recommend if for anyone who's looking to delve into this concept further, um, read any of the papers by Dr. Derek Lonsdale. He is really considered the pioneer of thiamine therapy. He was one of the first ones to bring it into the West and begin using it clinically in high doses. And um, later there is also Chandler Mars. They co-authored a book, which I will discuss later, uh, but it's really, really, really excellent work that they've been doing over the past couple of years. Derek Lonsdale, uh, I believe he recently just turned 99 and he's still publishing scientific articles on thiamine, which is absolutely fascinating. But this paper, paper in particular makes a very good argument that thiamine deficiency is hiding in plain sight. In fact, it is probably much more common than we are than what is conventionally believed to be that it is difficult to test for and we'll look at why that is and it's overlooked now there are some 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 assumptions some beliefs that with food fortification like i said they began synthesizing b1 and other b vitamins with food fort fortification you um you no longer have this problem of nutritional deficiency in the it, nutritional deficiencies in the western world or at least in first world countries and i know that your group in particular probably can see that that's a that that's inaccurate because nutritional deficiencies are really 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 quite common um but we'll look at why that is as well and what you can potentially do about that but just quickly to look at the prevalence so a couple of studies have looked at um, how frequent this actually is uh, outside of the context of, of vernic encephalopathy or dried beriberi, just in ordinary patient populations. So for instance, they will look at uh, obesity, diabetes, in, among uh, the psychiatric population, among the elderly, in people who are hos hospitalized. And they find that there is a pretty substantial portion of those people who by testing measures um, come up as deficient, although they may not present with any of the classical deficiency sy symptoms. And this is something which um, the authors of the studies, they they some of them seem quite baffled because you would think that if someone has a deficiency, then they would develop beriberi, but that's not the way that it plays out. Uh, you see that diabetes, if you look at the literature on diabetes, diabetes is almost synonymous with thiamine deficiency. And that's not really an over-exaggeration. Uh, the effect of diabetes, at least on the kidney, uh, causes a wasting of thiamine, substantial wasting, along with the biochemical defect of insulin resistance and uh, a variety of issues that happen at the cell level, there is a destruction of thiamine at the cell level. There's an inability to properly utilize it. And so almost every study that I've ever come across, at least, and there are several published on the topic of diabetes, has demonstrated uh, very substantial uh, declines in thiamine status. And this is by looking at several uh, multiple different measurements. Um, and so it does seem to be more prevalent than is conventionally thought. And the, the problem is, is or the, the question we would then ask is, why is it so frequently missed? Um, and what is the significance of this? Because a... Uh, as we will see, I mean, like I was saying before, there, there is this underlying uh, prevailing medical dogma. First of all, that thiamine deficiency was mostly eradicated in first world countries, and this was with food fortification. Well, this is uh, this is factually incorrect. Secondly, we have this concept that thiamine deficiency can be easily identified through blood, blood testing. So if you have a patient that you think is pre presenting with certain symptoms, and you would test the serum thiamine levels, and they would come back normal, then you would rule out the, the the idea that they are that they require thiamine that they're actually deficient and we'll see that this is also um, uh, uh, incorrect this is this is not a good way to go about it this is how things get easily missed um, and thirdly what we also see or this this idea that prevails is that only patients who fit the diagnostic criteria for those thiamine deficiency diseases will benefit from taking thiamine in other words if you do not fit within the box if you do not fit within that diagnostic criteria therefore uh, whether you have low levels or not that's not going to affect you in any way kind of this idea that um, that the, the the ultimate manifestation of the deficiency is the disease. And if you don't have that, then you're fine. Um, and I I, uh, I beg to differ on that, that case. So I think that one of the issues with the conventional medical system, at least, and even the alternative medical system, um, one of the reasons why this gets so overlooked or gets missed so, so, so frequently, I think partly is because you have these classical risk factors, which uh, practitioners are trained to look out for, right? So if you have an alcoholic Okay, I'm not a medical doctor, but if you have an al alcoholic that turns up into the emergency room, one of the first things that they will do is is either test thiamine or treat them automatically with thiamine, right? At least that's the that's the that's the general consensus among the doctors that I've spoken to about this. So alcoholism is known as one of the primary triggers or the causes of deficiency, and that's for several good reasons. Because not only does it impair the absorption, but it also actively destroys thiamine in the gut. It prevents the activation of thiamine. It prevents all of the, the kind of utilization of thiamine at the cellular level. So alcoholism is one of the key causes that is going to drive this. Um, if the patient is not severely malnourished, if they've not had recent gastro surgery, if they're not anorexic or bulimic, or if they don't have any of the, the typical malabsorptive disorders of the gut, say inflammatory bowel diseases, um, pancreatic insufficiency, bile insufficiency, whatever it is, um, then they're generally considered not to be a, a high likelihood to develop thiamine deficiency. If you don't have these things, and if you don't fit the diagnostic criteria for the thiamine deficiency diseases, it's kind of assumed that, well, it's 
it's not going to apply to you. So, so, so it's, it's never really investigated. Now, one of the issues with testing as well is say you do have a patient that you see and you think, well, actually, uh, this kind of looks like it might be related to B1. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to test them. Well, the problem is, is that the most common testing that's used is serum thiamine. At least in the UK, it's very difficult to find a GP who has access to any other kind of testing unless, unless it's with a private lab. I don't know what it's like in the US. I know LabCorp do a couple of other tests and things, but ultimately it can be very difficult to uh, obtain accurate testing. But serum thiamine only reflects recent intake. Now, there are cases in very, very, very severe end, end stage deficiency that you're going to be able to identify um, low thiamine by looking at serum thiamine uh, because it does tank in someone with like vernic encephalopathy or chronic alcoholic or something like that. But ultimately, uh, really, serum thiamine is going to bounce up and down within 24 hours or 48 hours, and it goes up and down depending on what you've eaten within the last 48 hours. So it's really not an accurate marker. And this, again, isn't a conventional point, isn't an unconventional um, standpoint. This is, this is well established in the literature. If you look at uh, thiamine deficiency testing, there's really two tests that are going to be uh, kind of gold standard. And even then there's problems. So the gold standard historically has been the erythrocyte transketolase test. And this is looking at the, um, the activity of an enzyme called transketolase in the blood cells. And basically what they can do is when they apply active thiamine to those blood cells, they can see how the enzyme reacts to that. Um, and then they can make a determination of whether someone is deficient or not. There is also another marker called uh, thiamine pyrophosphate, and that's in whole blood, and that's offered by LabCorp. I don't think they do uh, that anywhere else. I've not come across it anywhere else. Um, but again, what these are looking at is your systemic thiamine levels or how your blood cells, your whole blood, how much is in your blood, or how your blood cells are reacted to the thiamine. Ultimately, it doesn't tell you anything about what is going on at the organ level. And as you are going to see, is that, that is very problematic because particularly with B1, although I believe it does occur with other nutritional deficiencies as well, is you can and you can develop deficiencies at the organ level, even in a region of the brain, for instance. There are regions of the brain that, could, that, be, that can be deficient, while other regions of the brain are not. Uh, same as in the heart. There are compartments of the heart which can be deficient, whilst the rest isn't. So you're, looking at, you're using tests to measure a systemic markers, systemic levels, it really doesn't tell us much because uh, the, the conditions that tend to respond very well to B1, and we'll go into that in a lot more depth in the next presentation, particularly Parkinson's disease, fibromyalgia, neurodegenerative conditions such as uh, Huntington's, um, multiple sclerosis, these kind of conditions, uh, it's much more likely that the pathology is occurring uh, in a very uh, kind of small portion of the brain, let's say. And I don't want to be too reductionistic here, but that's what the evidence suggests. And so I think it's, it's important to know that there are inherent problems with relying on testing uh, to, guide, uh, to guide diagnosis. Now, coming back to this concept that the, the a deficiency in this vitamin is going to lead to uh, vernic encephalopathy or beriberi, which is what is frequently taught in medicine. Well, if we go back to the one of the very first studies, one of the very first studies on thiamine deficiency induced in man, I don't know if it could be published in to today's age because I'm not sure if it would be considered uh, ethical. But in this particular study, this was in 1940, they were they they had six volunteers, six women, and they put them on a diet which was 0.15 milligrams of thiamine per day. Now, for what it's worth, the RDA that you are going to you're going to be wanting on a daily basis to prevent frank deficiency disease is approximately one milligram to 1.5 milligrams. So this was about 10% of what you should be getting to pre prevent frank outright deficiency. And they kept them on this for almost three months. And <laughs> you want to see what they, what they said. So this study results was, they said neither acute, neither acute severe deprivation nor moderate prolonged deprivation of thiamine produced the classic syndrome of beriberi, which, is, which has been observed in the Orient. Basically, what they're saying is that despite having 10% of the amount of B1 on a daily basis for three whole months, none of them developed beriberi, right? Not one of them developed beriberi. And immediately, like what that suggests, and this has been replicated later on, what that suggests is that it's not only can someone sustain themselves to some extent on very, very, very nutrient-deprived diets, which I think is what we're seeing in our modern day, at least with the processed food. But it, <laughs> what they did find, and this is where it gets super, super interesting, is instead of seeing vernic encephalopathy, instead of seeing beriberi, no, they saw very run-of-the-mill symptoms, which <laughs> you probably witness on a day-to-day -day basis in what, 70 or 80% of your patient population, right? So depression, like really ordinary stuff, depression, generalized weakness, soreness of muscles and body pains, dizziness, low stomach acidity, impaired intestinal motility. Like these are super common symptoms 
that a, a large portion of the population have, right? Insomnia. I mean, how many people are taking sleep meds? How many people are taking antidepressants? How many people have what, uh, what has been diagnosed as IBS? Um, again, we, we, we also see that they develop these mild uh, POT symptoms, so postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, mild symptoms of autonomic nervous system dysfunction, so mild, uh, mild tachycardia on exertion. Uh, there was nausea and vomiting, but this was in the very late stages. So I believe this was like at day 70 or 75 or something. So this was almost at the three-month mark. Uh, again, physiological anorexia. So you had these, these subjects who essentially they were losing weight, they couldn't gain any weight. And I think uh, the authors discuss this in relation to digestion because and we'll talk about this a little bit later. You need B1 to digest your food. You need B1, vitamin B1 to absorb your food. And so not only did you have these markers of impaired digestive function, but you have this inability to actually gain weight and probably use the nutrients in the food that you're, that you're getting. Uh, you also had chronic fatigue and very low, low motivation for any physical activity. Now, in some of the subjects, in some, not all of them, there was apathy, brain fog, bloating, difficulty re regulating body temperature. And then they started, some of them did gradually begin to develop these more, more classical dry barrier, barrier symptoms. So numbness of the legs, neuropathy, uh, depression of tendon reflexes, et cetera. But this was later on. Uh, something also very interesting was that um, among, uh, uh, among a couple of them, their blood glucose measurements, which they were keeping track of, they began to resemble those of a diabetic, despite none of them having diabetes. And they were controlling for every other nutrient at this time as well. And what they also found later on is that with the addition of thiamine, so they actually treated these patients with thiamine, basically all of these symptoms disappeared. And so they were sure that the, the symptoms that we see on the screen right now were specifically because of the 10% of B1 that they were getting on a daily basis. And so this isn't <laughs> Wernicke encephalopathy. This isn't a dry berry, wet berry berry. This isn't Korsakoff psychosis. You know, this is very mild, run-of-the-mill stuff that most of us see, if, at least this is half of the stuff that people would come to me on a daily basis for, right? Find ways to approach this. And it turns out that a very mild or long-term deprivation of thiamine could produce all of these symptoms. And it, it kind of speaks to this concept that we need to, I say we, I think the medical, conventional medical thinking needs to reshape the way that it views deficiency, it needs to reshape the way that it's looking at nutrient sufficiency because it exists on a continuum, right? It's like there's this kind of all or nothing approach where conventional medicine tries to put things into boxes and it says, okay, if you're right on the left, then you must have all of these specific symptoms and then we can put a name on what you've got. So that's a diagnosable deficiency disease. disease. Or alternatively, you must be all the way to the right and you have optimal status and you're in optimal health. But the fact, I mean, you know, everyone here who works with human beings knows that that is not the case, or knows that, that there are, um, there seems to be in reality uh, more of a continuum. And that someone, if you examine their nutritional status, if you look at their diet, if you do functional testing and these kinds of things, and you will see that some people may only have certain symptoms, but that is on the progression towards a deficiency. They, ne they, they may never actually develop a diagnosable deficiency disease, but that's not to say that the IBS that they've been dealing with for 20 years is not because they have been kind of sitting at the edge and they fall somewhere in the middle. They might have a moderate insufficiency for whatever reason. There's lots of reasons why that might be. And this applies to nutrient, nutrients across the board, right? I'm not just saying this is thiamine. I mean, this is uh, nutritional requirements as a whole. And there are likely genetic factors or epigenetic factors and individual variation, environmental um, environmental conditions, which are going to either increase the de demand or perhaps preserve nutrients that someone has in the body or the way that they're able to utilize that. And so I think that if we begin to f look at this concept or uh, approach the concept of using thiamine from a medicinal standpoint, then it's important to keep this, this diagram in mind or this overall principle. So, uh, like I said, th this, this, this article is by Dr. Daryl Lonsdale. He writes for a website called Hormones Matter. If any of you are familiar with that, if you're not familiar with that, uh, you should definitely check it out. It is a very useful resource um, for information on, on thiamine. It is, uh, they're, they're not academic articles, but they are basically designed for the consumer to educate them on, on uh, various ways in which thiamine deficiency can contribute to, towards health problems. Uh, so as Dr. Derek Lonsdale says, uh, Barry Berry is alive and well in America. And I believe him, I, I, I believe he's true. I believe it's the case across the Western world, perhaps across the whole world, anywhere that is consuming high levels of uh, processed foods, refined carbohydrates, as we'll see. I'll go through what causes this. But ultimately, if we're looking at the things that are going to tank someone's thiamine status, looking at the things that can impair um, 
or that can reduce the amount of thiamine that we have in the body. Well, there's actually a lot. It's not just alcoholism. I mean, alcohol consumption is one of those things, but as we'll see, dietary choices as a whole, uh, the diet is always the fundamental baseline. It's always super important to, um, to be obtaining what you can from, although it's not always enough. And we'll go into why that is as well. But ultimately, the main dietary factors is going to be uh, what I refer to as empty calories. So essentially, you see, I've put in here, one of the causes is refined sugar and carbohydrate, white rice intake, processed foods. And this is something that they found way back then in Japan, as I said before. But ultimately, the pr processing of foods has increased exponentially since then, uh, particularly in the Western world, in developed countries. And the consumption of uh, processed foods has essentially skyrock skyrocketed. Now, what we're doing there is we are essentially destroying through the processing, whether it's chemical or heat treatment or whatever it is, freeze drying, you generally tend to destroy many of the nutrients, the thiamine being one of those. Uh, and what they try to do is they, they'll they add synthetic thiamine in to try to counteract that, although not, not every processed food does contain fort fortification. So we have this issue of this chronic or yeah, chronic and, and high consumption of empty calories in the empty being they're providing the macronutrients, they're providing carbohydrate, they're providing fat, but that is being removed or what's being taken from that is the micronutrients, which are necessary to process those macronutrients. And so I think one of the, the driving causes or one of the reasons why uh, B1 deficiency may be so prevalent in the West uh, and, and may be overlooked uh, is, is this long-term consumption of refined foods. The only issue is, is that food is, is simply one part of this puzzle. And I think this is where it gets super interesting. And this is really where my passion is, is that it's not only diet or let's say a dietary lack that can cause a problem in someone. And I think that's where many nutritionists uh, fail. You know, there's this underlying kind of belief that as long as you're getting everything from your diet, then you're going to be able to meet all of your nutritional demands. And it, that's quite ignorant of the way that the body tends to use nutrients under conditions of stress. So what I can say is that the research is quite clear. As the human body is under any significant level of physiological stress, and I don't just mean hormonal stress, I'm not talking about just the HP axis, although that is one part of this, but at the cellular level, when there is oxidative stress, when there is this state of chronic inflammation, when the body is essentially exposed to man-made uh, persistent organic pollutants, xenobiotics, bisphenol A, uh, heavy metals, you know, all of the kind of environmental toxicants that the human body comes into contact with, many of them have a direct impact on thiamine status, whether they directly inactivate it or they increase a certain process which enhances the demand for B1. There's, there are certain things that the body will do to counteract stress, but what that means is, is it increases the demand. And this is, this is acknowledged. There are many studies showing that uh, surgery or infection can be one of the the main triggers for sending someone over into vernicate encephalopathy, for instance. Um, there was one study, I can't remember the exact statistics, but it was showing that uh, before and after surgery, it was like uh, their thiamine state is tanked by like 70% because of the sheer amount of, 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 of stuff that the body needs to do in terms of repairing a wound, in terms of like maintaining the immune system, in terms of building new tissue. All of that is, is going to increase the demand for nutrition across the board. And in an ideal scenario, you know, let's say our ancestors, 10,000 years ago, you might cut your leg or whatever. Um, and the diet that you're eating in, in that moment in time may be enough to, to sustain you. But when we're living in our modern world, we're surrounded by so many of these stresses, so many of these kind of man-made stresses as well. It would seem as though uh, relying on diet solely is 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 not is not enough. I'm convinced of that. Um, and so, yeah, th th there are different disease states. There's chronic diarrhea, as I said, diabetes, certain kidney diseases, medications, uh, diuretics, uh, metformin, flagyl. Flagyl is a key trigger for sending someone over. If you have someone who reacts very negatively to the antibiotic met metronidazole, also known as flagyl, what that essentially does, uh, that blocks the action of thiamine in the cell. It prevents its activation. It prevents the cell from using it. And there are well-established, there's a couple of different research papers on it, actually, um, of the reaction to flagell actually being an unmasking of a thiamine deficiency. And they treat the patients with thiamine and the person has a positive response. They recover. Uh, there's many people on my group. I've, I've worked with tens of people, um, if not more, who have come to me specifically because they had metronidazole side effects. They may have developed twitching or neurological problems after taking this antibiotic. And when you treat them with thiamine, it generally tends to improve within a couple of weeks. Um, so the point I'm trying to get across here is that there are so many things which can impact our nutritional status that merely relying on diet alone is not necessarily going to be sufficient, especially in the people who are who are really quite sensitive and who have underlying chronic health issues as well.
Now, as I said, uh, carbohydrate consumption, consumption, particularly refined carbohydrate consumption, but carbohydrates in general. So even if it's not refined, just the simple act of consuming carbohydrate is going to increase the demand for B1. And as we'll look at, that's based on the biochemistry. It's really quite simple as to why that happens. Um, but this one study was looking at, uh, they, they didn't change any other uh, variable. And what they found was that just increasing carbohydrate consumption from 55% of the diet to 75%, uh, they found that there were pretty substantial reductions in plasma thiamine levels and in urinary thiamine. Uh, so ultimately, uh, it does seem as though the dietary choices uh, can really predispose one to this issue. Um, but there's also different disease states and things. And as I said before, I explained this concept of high calorie malnutrition, how we've basically been processing the foods, taking everything good out of it and, um, and replacing it with junk. Uh, and so if you have had science training, you will have done this at some point. And I really don't want to focus on these details because this is quite boring. I don't want to bore anyone here, but ultimately I have to go over the basic biochemistry because to, to appreciate the role that thiamine can, can have from a medicinal standpoint when using it in high doses for different conditions, it's, it's useful to have that, that biochemistry just as, as some background or just to re, rerun your memory on that. So very simple terms. It serves as an essential cofactor for numerous enzymes. Uh, these are enzymes involved in energy metabolism. So how we're taking glucose, fatty acids, amino acids, we're essentially running them through several steps and generating ATP in the mitochondria. It's also involved in how we're breaking down certain proteins or amino acids. And it's also useful for a pathway called the pentose phosphate pathway, which as you know, is going to be how we are essentially taking glucose. And instead of breaking it down for energy, we're using it to build up molecules. We're using it to regenerate uh, NADPH, which is then going to go on to uh, regenerate things like glutathione and stuff. So Lots of cool enzymes here. Uh, this is just an overview of the basic functions, the basic enzymes that it acts as a cofactor for. Um, and again, here's a diagram. Uh, the most important thing of this, and probably all, all, all already know this, but ultimately the, the point that I want to get across here, and this is um, this is super important, is that the just by chance, <laughs> and this is yeah, this is really significant, is that the enzymes that thiamine is necessary for are also considered rate limiting. Right, So we have this enzyme here, alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. This is considered to be now by some the rate limiting enzyme for the TCA cycle. Right, In other words, when that slows down, then every other step potentially also slows down and then ATP production as a whole slows down. Now, same for pyruvate dehydrogenase. When someone is metabolizing glucose, as in they're consuming a bunch of glucose, they're consuming carbohydrates, they need to break that down, they need to break pyruvate, convert it into acetyl-CoA. You're using thiamine to um, as a cofactor for this enzyme complex, but this is also considered rate limiting in carbohydrate metabolism. In other words, if you don't have enough thiamine, you cannot effectively break down carbohydrate. And um, again, this is a diagram from the PDF I've got. Centrally active TPP, so thiamine, as it gets into the cell, we activate it, and it's going to be used um, to allow the cell to generate energy in the form of ATP, but those steps are rate limiting and without enough thiamine, they effectively become inhibited or blocked, inactivated, whichever way you want to look at it. And the entire process slows down. This means that the cell is going to lose the ability to make energy. And this is like, this is key. This is central. Um, with the, I've seen some of the previous guests you've had on, the speakers you've had on, uh, you probably all appreciate the concept of bioenergetics, the concept of how bioenergetics is really fundamental to maintaining cellular health at practically every single level. And as mitochondrial function dis declines or is inhibited or is blocked by something, well, that is essentially seems to be the root of most chronic diseases. And so this is where thiamine also plays a central role, as do the other B vitamins. Again, this is just another little look at what thiamine is doing. And again, like I was just saying, it's really central for glucose metabolism. Now, also, if you have patients with diabetes, this is a reason to consider using B1, and B1 has actually a very good result if you look at the literature, particularly a form called benfotiamine, using it for diabetes. Not only does it, or can it, reduce diabetic complications across the board, practically or most of the diabetic complications, whether it be peripheral neuropathy or whatever, uh, benfotiamine can be very effective at doing that, but also uh, in just improving glucose disposal, in improving insulin sensitivity, improving uh, the way that cells are uptaking glucose. And it probably has at least something to do with stimulating the conversion of pyruvate into acetyl-CoA. Again, uh, and if you do not have this, so again, if you don't have this, then you're going to end up with pyruvate spilling over into lactate. And as it happens, lactic acidosis is or can be one of the consequences of a severe thiamine deficiency in certain individuals. Um, and lactate, again, high levels of lactate have been identified as a, as, as a driving cause behind other conditions such as fibromyalgia, um, other conditions which uh, feature 
chronic pain or discomfort or neuropathy, lactic acid can be involved in that as well. So lactate is generally not something that you want a lot of, of course, and thiamine seems to help the body to dispose of that. Now, just a very quick overview of how we process B1. Thiamine in the form of when it's coming in, in food, it's usually in the form of thiamine pyrophosphate. It's attached with phosphate group. Um, but what we need to do is we need to break it down into free thiamine, and then we're going to pass it through a bunch of different transporters. And then when we get it into the cell, there are multiple different types of thiamine transporters that we're using to get it into the cell. Um, and genetic variations can influence whether someone can get enough thiamine. For instance, there have been conditions which have been identified uh, where there are aberrations in the tr thiamine transporter one. And so, for instance, someone could be taking enough, but actually they, they can't get it into their cells and they develop a severe neurological kind of condition. And so in those people that are kind of uh, patients who would be reliant on high dose thiamine for long periods of time, this is usually going to be identified in, in childhood. As, and um, these are considered the disorders of metabolism. Uh, but just to give you a brief overview of the different types. In the cell, we have the, the main thing that we're really going to be concerned with today is thiamine pyrophosphate. I just like to have this here so that if you want to take a look at it or rerun your memory or anything, you can see. Basically, our, our main goal is to take free thiamine, get it into the cell, and then activate it into thiamine pyrophosphate. That's the thing. That's, that's, that's the thing that's working the magic. There are also these other derivatives which don't have very well-known functions. For instance, thiamine triphosphate seems to be super important for brain function and neuro neurotransmission, but they don't necessarily know why. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of research being done into that. One thing that I would say is that thiamine has a pretty integral relationship with magnesium, meaning that practically every function of thiamine is also going to depend on magnesium. They tend to go together and to activate thiamine, one also needs magnesium for the enzyme, which does that. Uh, so generally one pretty key principle to take away, even just to begin with, is that whenever someone, whenever a patient is administered thiamine, they should always be administered magnesium. And that's something that uh, many of the conventional uh, protocols that I've seen uh, don't don't include, and there 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 is a substantial benefit from doing that. There are some research studies looking at when you uh, give intravenous thiamine, you can actually make the patient magnesium deficient because thiamine is speeding up all of these processes. You use up a lot of the magnesium, and uh, especially if someone's subclinically magnesium deficient as well, uh, that's that's potentially a big problem. Likewise, you can find that sometimes if giving magnesium causes uh, strange symptoms, for instance, if someone is supplementing with magnesium, they get anxiety or they get jitteriness, sometimes that can actually respond to thiamine as well. But that's just a little side note. Um, something which is going to help guide your understanding of how this can be so useful from a medicinal perspective is understanding that thiamine is like really, really, really important for the way that nerves work, the way that our brain works, but also uh, more specifically, cholinergic function. So uh, this is not well understood, but it is known and it seems to be somewhat established that you cannot release, you cannot make acetylcholine, you can't release it from neurons, and it can't act on the adjacent neurons if you don't have enough B1. So thiamine is really, 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 really important for how the uh, the cholinergic system or the cholinergic neurons are communicating and ultimately how that is having an effect on the rest of the body. Now, it is kind of central to this point is the fact that the vagus nerve, which, as you know, is the primary parasympathetic nerve, the nerve which is essentially involved in helping the body get into this rest and digest state, into this anti-inflammatory state, well, its main neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. Now, there are a lot of interesting lines of research which look at how stimulating vagus nerve, stimulating the vagus nerve, either using artificial vagal, vagal nerve stimulation or through uh, other, other, other means, massages, etc., cetera, um, can have pretty remarkable benefits in inflammatory conditions at least. So if there is inflammatory bowel disease, uh, chronic pain, rheumatoid arthritis, anything which can enhance vagal nerve function can um, can improve the symptoms of those, those, those conditions. That's what the research suggests anyway. And it, it's the there is there is there is some evidence showing that thiamine deficiency or lack of thiamine reduces the activity of the vagus nerve and reduces the ability of the uh, the nervous system to synthesize acetylcholine. Now, when we factor in that thiamine is now being investigated for its role in Alzheimer's disease uh, by a, a doctor called Gary, Gary Gibson, he's at Burke Research Institute, and he recently was awarded, I think it was like, was it like 40 million or, or something like that in, in research funds for using high-dose benfotiamine in Alzheimer's uh, because it's thought as though one of the, the primary uh, kind of, uh, the primary drivers or one of the elements of Alzheimer's disease is a reduction in cholinergic neuron activity. And the, there, there was a couple of studies which looked or which, which demonstrated that the reduction in cholinergic activity was, um, it co was correlated with the severity of Alzheimer's. And so uh, thiamine is pretty 
is is well able to to enhance the the release of acetylcholine. Now, but looking at the vagus nerve as a whole, we have to understand that the vagus nerve is essentially innervating all of the internal organs. It's it, it's exerting its effect on on the whole of the body really. But this is important when you consider that you have this thing called the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway, right? So the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway is essentially one of the ways in which the brain is communicating through the vagus nerve. It's, it's picking up uh, peripheral signs of inflammation. It's picking up inflammatory cytokines. That information is being uh, relayed through the brain and then down through the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is then responsible for innovating the spleen, innovating the gut, innovating the rest of the organs. And it essentially dampens inflammation. So it can be dampening inflammation coming from the gut. It can it is in control of intestinal permeability. And of course, if you 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 keep up to date with a lot of the research now, there's so much which is looking at the 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 tight relationship between intestinal permeability and chronic disease, chronic inflammation. Uh, and, and, and you see that the vagus nerve is really, really the master conductor when it comes to determining whether the gut is permeable or not. And that's that's an interesting thing. You can use supplements like L-glutamine and you can use things from the bottom up and try to seal it from the inside. But ultimately, if the vagus nerve is not sending the, the correct signals, then the gut is, is going to have a tendency to become more permeable. But you also have these innovations at the spleen, and this is going to be dampening down uh, pro-inflammation, and it's going to be uh, in enhancing the release of cytokines, which are going to be responsible for, for controlling things. And so if you lose the ability to, uh, to communicate signals from the brain through the vagus nerve to the rest of the body, then you not only have this tendency towards this systemic pro-inflammatory state, but also considering that the vagus nerve is one of the main means by which the uh, autonomic nervous system is essentially controlling itself, right? Is that we have this balance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic and without vagus nerve function, then there is going to be an imbalance there. Um, and so let me just go back here. So one thing that I was interested in actually uh, to see was the number of people who would come to me with chronic gut issues, digestive conditions, whether that be small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, whether that be um, stomach acid problems, inflammation in the gut, gut infections, uh, could be chronic constipation or diarrhea and these kinds of things. And this is generally, uh, there's a lot of information on how to approach this from a, an alternative medicine perspective or a nutritional perspective. You use these supplements, you do this, this protocol, this anti antimicrobial protocol, take these antibiotics, kill these bugs, use these probiotics. You'd be amazed at how many people that actually just doesn't work for, right? And then they go on to someone else and then someone else and they just jump from practitioner to practitioner. Well, when I began using thiamine in clinical practice, uh, I was I was interested to see how many people's gut issues remarkably disappeared within like a week or two weeks. And uh, it happened time and time and time and time again. And there wasn't really any information. I tried to look online as to why this might be, you know, how could thiamine actually be doing this? How could, how could it be helping people's SIBO? How could it be, you know, basically fixing people's guts? Um, because there's practically nothing online about it. And so I did a little bit of digging and much of the research is published in Japan um, because they focused heavily on it after they essentially eradicated beriberi. Uh, they 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 invested lots of resources in studying thiamine and thiamine derivatives as much as they could. And it turns out they began using it for practically everything. <laughs> they were just like, they were throwing different types of thiamine at this condition, at that condition, at pain, at like gut issues, at small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, although it wasn't called that back then. They were basically trying to treat everything with it. And it didn't work for everything. But what they did find was that was it was pretty remarkable at improving um, these kind of chronic gut complaints that are really, really, really super common these days. Uh, and so it turns out that thiamine is going to be acting directly on the enteric neurons to enhance cholinergic function. If you look at gut motility, gut secretion, you know, the entire function of the gut really depends on messages coming from the vagus nerve. It depends on um, because you have the, the the vagus nerve essentially connecting with the enteric neurons, and then they are either going to tell the gut, they're either going to tell the stomach to start generating stomach acid. They're going to tell the stomach to start propelling food and open the sphincters. You need to open sphincters and close sphincters in the intestine. You need to make sure that there's enough mucus. You need to make sure that the pancreas is releasing what it needs to at the right time. You need to make sure that actually you're getting the right propulsion. All of these like amazing coordinated events really depend, like are absolutely fundamentally dependent on the vagus nerve, and this can be seen from people who have uh, vagotomies, right? When they have their vagus nerve removed, uh, some people completely lose their digestive function. Now, to some extent, it it, it, um, it it can function independently, right? But for optimal function to prevent things like small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and all of these kind of chronic conditions of gut, yeah, the, the vagus nerve is super important. It turns out that it's because of the, the acetylcholine released at those junctions, which is going to be the main messenger 
coming uh, to tell those gastric organs what to do and at what times. And so uh, what I suspect is that that is one of the main mechanisms by which um, when you apply thiamine clinically, uh, you see that uh, sometimes people who have gone through years and years and years of treatments to address their chronic gut problems, uh, you find that actually thiamine, thiamine was the missing link because it's enhancing the communication from the brain to the digestive system. Um, now, just from a broader perspective, I want to make it clear before we talk, start looking at how this is can be used in clinical practice, how it can be used, what it can be used for. Uh, I think it's important to have some context, some broad, uh, some broad context, because it would seem as though there is something that can be quite special about B1, and I'm not sure exactly why that is, but it would seem as though B1 is employed by living organisms across multiple kingdoms, you know, ranging from bacteria to plants to humans. It does seem to have universally applicable anti-stress properties. That's why I believe it to be uh, an, a universal anti-stress molecule. And I think that's one of the reasons why it can be used um, so effectively for such a wide range of different things, which we haven't looked at just yet, but we will get to. Uh, ultimately, in plants, you see that it's, it's quite remarkable. In plants, one of the first things that they will do when a plant comes into contact with an environmental stressor is it will in increase the rate at which thymine-dependent enzymes are working. It will in increase gene expression for the proteins which are going to be making B1, right? And then the B1-dependent processes will, um, will increase as, as part of an adaptation to that. But that is one of the ways in which they sense the environment. They're, they're, they're using all of the thymine-dependent processes to essentially sense, and what they refer to this as, so it says from this paper, the recently reported activation of thymine production in plant cells under biotic and abiotic stress conditions also suggests a non-cofactor ro non role of this vitamin as a stress alarmone or stress protectant to enable plants to survive in unfavorable environments, right? That's super interesting. And then again, we have the same thing in... Um, in another plant, we see biosynthesis of thiamine compounds and thiamine diphosphate dependent enzymes in abiotic stress sensing and adaptation processes in plants. So it seems to be pretty integral how many, if not all plants, I don't know, but at least in many different species of plants, they use thiamine, specifically thiamine, to strength, to, to identify and to cope with environmental stress. Uh, you see, it's one of the ways in which they uh, modulate their immune system to stresses. So Furthermore, we, we revealed that exogenous thiamine enhanced stress tolerance in cotton via increasing... Blah, 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 blah. Essentially, what they did was they found that um, a way that these plants were, um, were, 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 were coping with thiamine was they were using a lot of it up. And what they found was that when they gave these plants extra thiamine, that they could effectively adapt to the stress and remain kind of untainted. You see a similar thing in E. coli bacteria. Um, it seems as though they synthesize thiamine under severe energy stress, and it's not entirely certain why that is. But again, they use this concept of um, an alarmone or a signaling molecule. So there seems to be, throughout nature, this relationship between stress and thiamine. And this, again, this, the argument could perhaps be made for certain other nutrients, maybe vitamin C. But uh, there, it certainly seems applicable for, for B1 as well, and this doesn't really get the attention that it deserves. Now, uh, if we look in humans, I mean, what is the, you know, the prototype of stress, at least from the cellular level, if you were to define stress at the cellular level, what would that be? Or what would, how, how would that look? Uh, it, if we consider that all cells, our cells require energy and to make energy, not only do we need those nutrients, we need macronutrients, we need micronutrients, but ultimately we need oxygen. That's why we breathe. Right. And when cells become hypoxic, this is sometimes referred to as the cell stress response, right? It's the hypoxic or the response to hypoxia. The cell is mobilizing a bunch of different uh, responses to deal with that as a significant stressor. Now, what we see is that thiamine insufficiency or thiamine deficiency seems to be somewhat synonymous with hypoxia. It, if we look at what hypoxia does to a cell, well, as part of the response, you, you get the stabilization of something called hypoxia inducible factor one alpha. And that's uh, one of the things that is going to be initiating lots of the changes that's going to help a cell adapt to low oxygen concentrations and try to obtain more oxygen. We see that thiamine deficiency does that. But what's also really interesting is that one of the first things that a cell will do when it becomes hypoxic is, <laughs> it's remarkable, one of the first things it will do when it's hypoxic is it will increase SLC19A3, which is the thiamine transporter. Okay, so a cell identifies that there is hypoxia, mobilizes a stress response again, like we see in the plant kingdom, like we see among bacteria, at least E. coli. Well, we can't synthesize thiamine, but what we can do instead is we can suck it up from the environment, right? So thiamine, again, again, this is from a more broader uh, 
perspective, there seems to be this in- relationship between uh, stress response and an increased demand for this nutrient. I think this is one of the reasons that can help us to explain why it can then be used in the modern day world when humans are exposed to so many stresses, whether that be toxic, whether that be chemical, you know, whatever it is, radiation, uh, the, the, the mixture of things that we're exposed to on a daily basis, it would seem as though B1 can be used to help to counteract that. And that that has been borne out in the research. Uh, but again, we'll just, just here this slide is looking at the the the, the well, uh, the similarities in the cellular response, thiamine deficiency and hypoxia are essentially the same. Okay, you get a buildup of pyruvate, you get a buildup of lactate, buildup of reactive oxygen species, stabilization of hypoxia inducible factor one alpha, and eventually, if it's not fixed, you get cell death. So I, I feel as though there's there's some significance there at least. And like I've said here, here's here's a diagram of the thiamine transporter one, the thing which is uh, increased uh, to a significant extent when the cell is stressed, when the cell is hypoxic. So yeah. Now uh, just to look at some of the more, uh, from a mechanistic standpoint, the effect that this is going to have on cells, particularly the brain, because the brain being the most, one of the most, it's got such a high rate of metabolism, right? And it would seem as though the brain out of all of the organs is the most affected by uh, even a mild deficiency in B1. And we'll look at exactly kind of how that affects things. Here is a diagram looking at what happens when you don't have enough B1. Well, you get this inhibition of certain enzymes, you get an inhib- inhibition of transketolase. What that means is you have less NADP- NADPH there to um, regenerate our antioxidant system. So we end up with a, a burden or, re- um, yeah, a burdened antioxidant system, uh, our glutathione status or reduced glutathione tends to tank, uh, as do the other uh, intracellular antioxidants. You also see there's an inhibition of this enzyme, this enzyme, this enzyme, and all of this fundamentally um, culminates in neuron, neuronal damage, mitochondrial dysfunction, and eventually cell death. Now, a really important part of this in the brain, at least, is that this enzyme, which you need B1 for, and is actually the most sensitive to a B1 deficiency, alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. This plays a dual role. In fact, it plays multiple roles. And we'll look into that in a short while. Ultimately, this doesn't only, it's not only involved in the in the, in the the conversion of, or the, the metabolism of acetyl-CoA into essentially making a intermediates to go into the electron transport chain and make energy. It's not only involved in that, but it's also involved in how we're clearing or managing the levels of an amino acid or neurotransmitter in this context, glutamate. And so it, un, under healthy conditions, glutamate is, if it gets too high, that can be fed into the TCA cycle here, and we can actually use glutamate to make ATP. Um, the problem is, is if we don't have enough of this enzyme, alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, because we don't have enough B1, well, then you end up with a situation where glutamate get, becomes too high. Now, that leads to a condition which you're probably familiar with. It's called excitotoxicity. It's essentially neurons firing too too fast. They're firing excessively. Um, and this is one of the 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 mechanisms which is thought to underlie most neurodegenerative conditions, some element of excessive neuron firing and some element of high high, high levels of glutamate too, too much. Um, and so we see some of the other mechanisms of glutamate excitotoxicity. Well, we end up with um, release of neurotoxic factors, again, impaired uh, glutamate uptake that can happen. We see that there's a bunch of other stuff that takes place. And again, I don't want to go into too much detail on this, but essentially the brain cells begin to decline in the health. You get a lack of energy in the mitochondria. You get elevated reactive oxygen species. You get damage to the polyunsaturated fats that line the, the, the membranes of the, of the neurons. And you you can eventually get cell death. And that is basically equivalent with neurodegeneration. And again, this is looking at how thiamine deficiency independently can cause a lot of the things that we know as the mechanisms behind neurodegeneration. Again, this neuroinflammatory environment where you have these microglial cells, which are basically secreting all of these um, inflammatory chemicals, which are then going on to like damage the blood vessels in the brain, damage the the neurons themselves. So overall, thiamine uh, being so important for the brain seems to parallel, at least the effects that it has in the brain seems to parallel many of the neurodegenerative problems that that seem to be on the rise. Um, And so, so here is where it gets super interesting is that the areas of the brain which are most susceptible to a B1 deficiency are going to be uh, very selective brain regions. These are like the lower regions of the brain. So you have the brain stem, you have the uh, mammillary bodies, the thalamus, the, uh, the, the area that is basically uh, highlighted in blue here. It turns out that these are the same areas which are responsible for coordinating the autonomic nervous system. And so these are not only the first areas that if someone has a B1 problem, they're going to start developing problems in those regions, 
But as is so eloquently described in this book by Chandler Mars and Dr. Daryl Lonsdale, as I was talking about before, uh, it's titled Thymine Deficiency Disease, Dysautonomia and High Calorie Malnutrition. Uh, it would seem as though dysautonomia in any of its shapes and forms, and I feel as though the concept of dysautonomia, if, you, if you've been taught about it, if you know about it, if you use it, if you diagnose people with it, I don't know. Uh, I feel as though the umbrella of dysautonomia generally is quite, um, it's quite narrow. And the reason I say that is because there are many, many, many health conditions, many health conditions, which have dysautonomic elements. So elements of autonomic nervous system dysfunction as part of their kind of central pathophysiology, the driving, the driver behind the condition, but are not classically considered to be, to fall under that umbrella. I'll give you an example, fibromyalgia. So fibromyalgia, as, as I understand it from a medical standpoint, is considered uh, to fall under the category of rheumatology. Right? because it's affecting the muscles and the joints and basically the, the 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 connective tissue whereas if you look if you really dig into the literature on 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 fibromyalgia uh, it would seem as though the bulk of it is actually highlighting this to be a central nervous system problem and by uh, extension an autonomic nervous system problem now there are that of course there's probably not just one cause of fibromyalgia but frankly the number of people i've seen treated or i've, I've treated with a thymine uh, I can't explain how they respond. We'll talk about this in the next presentation as well. There are uh, there's 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 online groups about it. There was a doctor named Antonio Costantini. He published a case study, um, uh, twenty thirteen, I believe. It was it was a small one, three three patients, um, and within within what was it two or three weeks, um, he found that they had achieved anywhere from sixty to ninety percent improvement in pain and fatigue just using thymine. No other medications. No other therapies. And these, this was considered severe fibromyalgia that had persisted for several years prior. The only thing they'd done was use thymine. And that sparked a lot of interest online. Um, after that, there were, there's probably been tens of thousands of at least tens of thousands of people who have taken taken uh, their, their health into their own hands and have begun using thymine in high doses uh, based on that uh, case study that was published. And it's really remarkable how many people you would see that can basically dissolve chronic fatigue and body pain that has responded to practically nothing else, just using thymine alone. And if fibromyalgia is a rheum rheumatological condition, I can't explain why that is, because these people generally don't test as having thymine deficiency, even when you use the, the most comprehensive testing and you do, you know, you do a full workup and there's no identification. They have no risk factors. They have no other identifiers that would indicate that they were deficient in this nutrient, yet it can almost reverse their condition, like as in reverse, and that's not an exaggeration, reverse their condition almost overnight with a simple B vitamin. If, if it's not a dysautonomia, then I don't understand how that works. There's, as, as we'll see, uh, dysautonomia, I think of every kind, unless it's say autoimmune or say infection mediated could potentially respond to B1. And the reason is Derek Lonsdale, he, he is considered the pioneer of thymine therapy. Um, and the reason is, is because he's been using it. I mean, he was a, he was a pediatrician at the Cleveland clinic, I think since the sixties or even the fifties. And he was using thymine treating children, uh, specifically with B1 and different types of B1 treat thousands and thousands of children over several decades. And he, um, he came to the conclusion that dysautonomia was in many cases, just a, a mild form of beriberi that was not being picked up. You know, like we were talking about before, where you had that original study looking at B1 deficiency and how it affects the body and how none of them developed beriberi, how none of them developed Wernicke encephalopathy, but they did develop symptoms of dysautonomia. Well, that's kind of what we're looking at. And that's what you tend to see clinically as well. Uh, as, as he states in this paper, which I'd, I'd highly recommend if you'd like to learn about some of the mechanisms by which this works, evidence is presented that loss of oxidative efficiency, particularly affecting the limbic and the limbic brain and brainstem, is responsible for both the dysautonomia and possibly its associated organic disease. So concept is, is that because those areas of the brain which are responsible for controlling the balance between sympathetic and parasympathetic, those areas of the brain are selectively targeted by a deficiency in B1. When you don't have enough, there is a lack of oxidative efficiency. What that means is you don't make enough energy in those regions of the brain. Um, and there is evidence for this, that, uh, that that is going to lead to essentially the way that he perceives it, and I think it might be correct, is you end up with misfiring essentially. So you may, you may have uh, faulty signals, misfiring at certain times, and that may potentially be able to explain why you have difficulty, patients with difficulty with temperature regulation, difficulty with circulation. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, you know, sometimes it's super hot, sometimes it's super cold. It's basically the autonomic nervous system is just all over the place. There's no balance. There's no central control. And 
his concept is, is that uh, you need energy coming from the brain, central energy to exert uh, systemic control. Uh, and interestingly enough, we look at common conditions which feature signs of dysautonomia. Like I mentioned, fibromyalgia, although it's not considered a dysautonomia, a, a, a type of dysautonomia, uh, there's a lot of evidence which would suggest it is. Chronic fatigue syndrome, again, uh, this can be a very difficult condition to treat, as I'm sure many of you know. However, also considered a form of dysautonomia and under certain circumstances, IBS, any issue with the gut. I found any issue with the gut. I've not yet come across one single issue, like one single kind of uh, characterizable gut condition, whether it be SIBO, IBS, or inflammatory bowel disease or whatever, that, that doesn't potentially respond to B1. Now, I want to make it clear that not everyone does. In fact, it's probably only a small proportion of people, maybe 10, 20, maximum 30% of people uh, that I've personally seen and worked with and, and have spoke to uh, are find benefits. However, it's better than, it's better than none, right? And I'm not saying that it's the it's the it's the treatment or that it's a panacea because it's clearly not. However, it can work and it's certainly worth a try because it's completely safe and effective, or it's safe uh, and it can be effective. Another thing which I um I haven't spoken about publicly for obvious reasons is uh, is long COVID. Uh, what you will find is that many in the long COVID community uh, stumbled across either my work or La Dr. Daryl Lonsdale's work and began using B1. And there are tons of testimonials of people who essentially address their dysautonomia or long COVID or even post-vaccination uh, dysautonomia. There are people who respond to thiamine. Now, I have two interviews up on my channel. At the moment, I have an interview uh, with, they're, they're both with uh, young men and um, both of them developed pretty substantial dysautonomia symptoms that affected them systemically that developed chronic fatigue syndrome, body pains, uh, gut issues after getting COVID. And uh, it was only after using B1 uh, in the right form, the right dose. It took a while, but they they managed to find their sweet spot that they are almost, I mean, uh, one guy's at what he says is about 85% recovered. The other guy's at about 99% recovered. So uh, it can be very useful in the era of long COVID or even people who've been taking vaccines and have found that they get this kind of post-vaccination dysautonomia. Uh, again, it's it's not necessarily the cure-all, but it's worth a try. So dysautonomia symptoms, for those of you who are unaware, basically all of these, if you see any patient with any of these symptoms, usually a collection is going to be a collection of these symptoms. So like I said, if you've got someone with abdominal pain, reflux, or uh, constipation, and at the same time, they might say that they get a little bit short shortness of breath when they stand up. They might say that sometimes they have brain fog, or they get a little bit dizzy, um, or another frequent kind of symptom, which... Yeah, which comes up sometimes is difficulty with urine. So someone might say that they actually, uh, that they have to concentrate to release urine from the bladder. Like any of these symptoms on here right now, if you see any collection of those, those can also be a symptom of a demand for thymine. And so like forget or put to the side what we were talking about before with beriberi and Wernicke encephalopathy. And this is what I'm saying, how conventional medicine and even alternative medicine come into contact with these kinds of people on a daily basis, because I know that I did come into, into contact with these people on a daily basis and don't think to use B1. But as we've seen, there is this substantial relationship between B1 and dysautonomia. And that, that, that's clear. And all of these symptoms can be signs of this underlying autonomic nervous system dysfunction. So I just urge you, honestly, I urge you, if you work with clients, if you work with patients, if you see these symptoms, especially if they, they come together, uh, really, really try, try thiamine. Think about trying thiamine. Uh, even just investigate it because you might be amazed. You might be amazed at how many people actually respond to this. Um, okay, so quick recap. A lack of thiamine can manifest as a collection of very nonspecific symptoms, like we said that early mm -hmm. study. It can be difficult to identify through ordinary testing. The issue is, is that serum thiamine is usually the one that's employed, and uh, it frankly doesn't measure much. It measures what you've recently intaken. You, it doesn't tell you what's going on in the brain, in the heart, in the organs, even in the muscles. Okay, uh, pl Thiamine plays an essential role in energy metabolism. Most importantly, the metabolism of glucose. If you don't have enough B1, you lose the ability to turn sugar into energy. And this is particularly important given the fact that we most people have lived on at least a, you know some of their diet being processed carbohydrates and processed uh, sugars. And this is why I believe that many of the people who present with these symptoms, uh, if they have come from a long-term history of eating a standard American diet, a diet which is uh, rich in these processed foods, even if they change their diet afterwards, you know, even if they go you know carnivore, they go animal-based, they try to do whole food, plant-based or whatever it is, and they, they cut the sugar completely, it doesn't matter. It's almost as though that long-term increased demand uh, kind of uh, kind of carries over. And so sometimes the only way to bring someone out of that state is to actually replenish B1. 
And, uh, and finally, it's also necessary for neurotransmission, the production of neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. As we looked at, without acetylcholine, not only does your brain not work properly, not only do you lose your ability to focus and remember things, is one of the reasons why uh, cholinergic treatments, even thiamine itself, is being investigated in Alzheimer's uh, for its potential benefits. But I think most importantly is you lose vagus nerve control. And so really, you've got this two-pronged issue here with not enough B1. Not only, not only do those areas of the brain, uh, the... The, the lower areas of the brain, you they're selectively targeted by B1 problem. So you lose uh, the oxidative efficiency, as Lonsdale would put it. But at the same time, you lose the ability to use a vagus nerve. You, you know, the vagus nerve can't, can't send the right messages to different parts of the body. And so, uh, again, this, this kind of comes together and is a real, real problem. Now, I mentioned before, I don't, I don't want to bore you guys with this, but ultimately, to when we trying to understand, I, I, I guess I didn't give an overview before, there are two parts to this. There is identifying a deficiency and treating a deficiency. Now, generally what you will find is that people who are deficient, they will most oftentimes uh, see improvement within you know, a month, maybe a couple of weeks, and it will generally take maybe three to four, three to four months maximum, sometimes a little bit longer, depending on the severity, uh, three to four months to regain almost 100%. So all of the symptoms which were caused by the deficiency in the first place. So if it was the dysautonomia, the IBS, the chronic fatigue, whatever it was, uh, that will that will kind of address itself. Um, and these people are pretty straightforward in terms of what how, how to deal with them. The issue is, is that there is like an other half of this, which... I hadn't managed to put in this presentation because there is so much information, but ultimately it's when we're using thymine pharmacologically, we're using it, uh, not trying to address the deficiency. And the reason for that is comes down, I believe partly at least to this enzyme. Um, but in very simple terms, the nuts and bolts of it is, is that there is an abundant amount of research, which indicates that you can have the equivalent of a deficiency in a brain, in, in the brain, in the heart, or even in certain regions of the brain. And this is, this, is, this is regardless of diet. Someone can be eating an excellent diet. They can have none of the risk factors for a deficiency. And yet the, the way that the cells are affected, because you have an inhibition of these B1-dependent enzymes, you get the equivalent situation. So all of those things, right? So for instance, all of these effects in the brain, the oxidative stress, the glutamate excitotoxicity, the inflammation, the impaired glucose metabolism, all of those things can happen even if someone has enough thiamine in the diet. And then we're not talking about a thiamine deficiency. What I call this is a thiamine dependency. And this is not very well characterized in the literature, although some of the, some of the real hardcore thiamine scientists have seen this and they kind of call it by different names. But what we're looking at there is we're looking at someone who is going to likely require sustained super high doses, maybe for the rest of their life, or at least for a significant period of time. And I'll explain why that is in a short while, but uh, that's not something I'm necessarily going to focus on too much but today, but I find that, that to be the most interesting because what it tells us or what it shows us, at least, is that someone does not need to be deficient to benefit from taking thiamine in high doses. This is what excites me the most because I think half of the people who find my work, and there's, there's thousands of them, honestly, and I get, I get kind of, not to beat my own bush, I don't want to, but it's, it's kind of just correct. I get tons of fan mail all the time. People get in contact and basically saying, oh my God, you know, I had this condition. I watched some of your videos and I started taking B1. It was really difficult at the start, but then all of a sudden it, you know, it radically kind of trans transformed their condition, whether it was Parkinson's disease or fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome. But their issue was, was when they stopped it, all of the symptoms come back. And these people, sometimes they can be on it for six months. They can be on it for a year. And when they stop it, the symptoms return. So it really is, it's, it's a way to manage it. And they're, they're, I'm going to talk about this a lot in the next uh, presentation because this will be looking at the work of Antonio Cosentini. But in, in, in just to give you a brief overview, uh, he worked with, he was a neurologist. He was the guy who did the case study on fibromyalgia. He found that um, giving 1,500 milligrams, which is for what it's worth, it's about a thousand times the RDA, right? <laughs> giving a thousand times the RDA was not enough. It didn't make any changes in those patients. However, when they reached a threshold, which was 1,800 milligrams, most of their symptoms disappeared within a very short, short time. It was kind of like overnight. Now, he found something similar in Parkinson's disease. He treated, um, he didn't publish all of his findings, but he treated thousands of patients with Parkinson's. Um, and at least a, a portion of those he used, he used thiamine and he would use injections, but some he would also use uh, thiamine hydrochloride orally. And uh, for many of those patients, they were in complete symptomatic remission and they are still in symptomatic remission to this day. Parkinson's disease, right? We're told that is completely incurable, but these guys are off their medication. They no longer require L-dopa. L Some of them still do take it, but there are many who have managed to completely eradicate the symptoms as long as they take B1. And then when they stop taking it, they come back. And that's, it's pretty tragic because B1 clearly isn't curing the problem, but what it, I believe it's doing mechanistically, and I think we can explain it from a mechanistic perspective, at least partially, I think it has to do with 
factors other than nutrition, factors other than diet, which are inhibiting those B1 dependent enzymes. And what is happening is we're using super high doses to overcome that inhibition. And uh, I'll explain shortly, but just, just briefly, we're nearly at the end now, but Ultimately, like I said, I think it might come back down to this complex, this alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex. Now, this has gotten a lot of attention, like a lot of attention in recent years. It seems to be a pretty special enzyme. Now, remember, this is one of the enzymes sitting in the TCA cycle, okay? Now, it's considered rate limiting. So in other words, when it slows down or when it becomes blocked or inactivated, then the process of making energy also slows down. Now, that can be useful. And you guys are probably familiar with this concept, but ultimately reactive oxygen species, they, they serve useful signaling roles, you know? And so this, this complex is, is like, it's referred to as either a hub of plasticity or it's referred to as a mitochondrial redox sensor. What it's basically doing is scanning the environment. It's scanning how much energy the cell needs. And it's also scanning how much is coming in. So if the cell is overloaded with energy, then there's going to be reactive oxygen species, which essentially tell this enzyme to stop working. What that does is it slows down, stops the intake of, uh, of energy intermediates, and then things normalize, and then you can start making energy again. So it's basically one of the ways in which the cell controls reactive oxygen species. It controls the rate at which it's making energy. It controls lots of other things. As you see here, it regulates the TCA cycle, modulates response to hypoxia, um, regulates cell protein signaling. It does lots of wonderful things. Now, this particular paper published recently is looking at how this one enzyme is Okay, not to be too reductionistic, but it seems to be pretty central in neurodegeneration. Um, there seems to be things that go wrong for whatever reason, and it seems as though this enzyme could be a target to improve neurodegeneration. So this is a this is a little diagram here. It's looking at the consequences of inhibiting this enzyme short term has benefits, but then long term it has detrimental effects. So again, the body is meant to be able to turn things off, switch things on, and switch things off as it needs to. Problem is when it becomes chronic, then it contributes to pathology. Now, it turns out that this enzyme is, has been found to be uh, inhibited, abnormally inhibited or pathologically inhibited in a bunch of different neuro neurodegenerative conditions. Parkinson's, for instance. In fact, the severity of Parkinson's disease, okay, here's, here's the interesting thing. The severity of Parkinson's, Parkinson's sympt symptoms, at least in one pa paper, was found to be uh, correlated with the degree of inhibition of this enzyme, okay? Likewise, in Huntington's disease, they found it. They found it recently as well. Alzheimer's disease, very significant. They also found it in uh, spinal cord injury, head trauma. There's research showing, and this is uh, particularly important, research showing that one of the main mechanisms of injury to the cells, when they bash uh, animals over the head, they cause you know, uh, intentional head trauma. And then they dissect the brain and they look at all of the en enzymes involved in like uh, the mitochondrial metabolism, they're looking at inflammatory compounds and things. They, they came to the conclusion that this one enzyme was probably responsible for a lot of the oxidative stress that occurred post head trauma, because of course you've got the initial event of trauma, but then you've got the actual, the after effect, which is usually where the real damage occurs. It's the brain gets into this state of hyperinflammation. It can't turn that down and you get like this excitotoxicity. And that's when the cells uh, the majority of the brain damage occurs. It's like in the in the aftermath of that. And so what they found was was that if you could pharmacologically prevent this alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex from being inactivated, then you could prevent a lot of the brain damage that occurred from head trauma. Like that was crazy, right? So, so they bashed animals over the head. They found that this enzyme was inhibited, and there was a bunch of bad stuff that happened. I can't remember all the details, but it was like glutamate. It was like all this all this stuff. Okay. And then what they did was they administered massive doses of thiamine to them pre-head trauma. So one group with head trauma, one group they gave massive amounts of thiamine to beforehand. And they found that like most of the markers of neuroinflammation and brain damage were no longer there in the thiamine treated group. And so they concluded, and there's been a bunch of research after this based on these kind of results, they concluded that this enzyme is pretty darn important for controlling the response to injury and stress of any kind and to maintaining... Elliot, you've frozen. Really suffered that many bad effects. It has enough resilience to be able to patch up the damage. Of course, you're going to have the trauma, but ultimately you can prevent much of the damage by maintaining ATP. And you do that by maintaining alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. And how do you do that? Or how did they do that in the research? Several studies done this, by the way, by giving pharmacological doses of thiamine. So we have this overall picture. And I don't, I don't think half of the research has been done, honestly. I think if you were to look at other conditions, you would also see a similar thing, is that you have this underlying 
inhibition of this this guy and what that is having is downstream effects and for whatever reason it's inhibited pathologically so the cell can't turn it back on and there's a couple of reasons why these enzymes might be inhibited for instance you've got a bunch of bad stuff which does inactivate them so for instance some of the neurotoxic compounds that occur in parkinson's disease they directly inactivate this complex oxidative stress itself a uh, nitric oxide proxy nitrate etc in inhibit this enzyme heavy metals uh, man-made chemicals mycotoxins fungal mycotoxins um and inflammatory agents so if you've got someone who has this low level inflammation for whatever reason might have nothing to do with b1 they have this low level inflammation they have this tendency you know they're exposed to radiation they're exposed to whatever it is they've got other nutrient deficiencies who knows they've got toxins they've got heavy metal exposure and they've got this low level not only neuroinflammation they've got leaky gut so they've got all this bad stuff getting into the brain they've got this tendency towards excitotoxicity glutamate excitotoxicity um this tendency towards this low level oxidative stress there's some kind of a stress or whatever it is it would seem as though this has the potential to cause a physiological situation or let's say a at the cellular level, a biochemical equivalent to a thiamine deficiency, because in thiamine deficiency, this enzyme slows down. If I, I hope that makes sense. Um, another researcher who I would, if you want to learn more about this, I highly recommend looking at her stuff. It's really technical, uh, but she's done fantastic work over the past couple of decades. Her name is Victoria Bunek. She's based in Russia. And she um, has, she published this paper, she's called them thiamine diphosphate dependent enzymes. The impression that she feels is that there's something special about thiamine dependent enzymes because she refers to thiamine diphosphate. She says, thus it can be seen that thiamine diphosphate is a universal systemic regulator at the transcriptional, translational, and post-translational levels acting through essential impact of thiamine, dif thiamine diphosphate dependent enzymes on central metabolism, right? A universal sy systemic regulator. There's something special about these enzymes and B1 that has something to do with how the cell is responding to stress. And if we can manipulate that, or if we can I don't want to use the word manipulate, but if we can utilize that knowledge, then we can perhaps understand how B1 can be used from a medicinal perspective in different conditions and why we may need higher doses than what you might find in the diet. Another paper, which I also highly recommend, is looking, uh, it's titled, um, what was it titled? Yeah, Interactions of Oxidative Stress with Thiamine homo Homeostasis. So basically, if you've got oxidative stress, that that depletes your thiamine chemistry. Like I was saying at the start, we've got this idea that if you eat a diet, if you if you have this nutritional requirement and you're getting the RDA, you shouldn't need to take any nutrients. You shouldn't need to take any supplements. But that's not true in someone who has a chronic health condition. If they have a chronic health condition that features some level of oxidative stress, that is potentially at least going to be affecting at least, at least B1. And we know that affects the other antioxidants, you know, vitamin C, vitamin E, uh, the other B vitamins, but especially thiamine. And so what you can end up with is you can end up with this state where someone might have underlying inflammation, underlying toxicity, and yet it is inducing a deficiency despite them eating the normal amount in the diet. And this deficiency uh, kind of equivalent or this functional deficiency at the cellular level, no matter how much you eat in the diet, it's not going to be fixed. And there's a couple of reasons for that. But for instance, it says the vulnerability of thiamine homeostasis to oxidative stress may explain deficits in thiamine homeostasis in numerous neurological disorders like we've been talking about. Okay. So uh, this little diagram that I made, again, it's just really simplified toxins, oxidative stress, inflammation, enzyme inhibition, and those are the thiamine dependent enzymes. It means we can't turn molecule A into molecule B. You get enzyme inhibition and you get the equivalent of a deficiency. I hope that people can understand that. That's the main thing that I'd like to get across. Again, similar thing. I've put some of the, the things that have been known to uh, affect this and we kind of end up with a situation where your cells can't make energy. Now uh, that we come to the concept of using high doses and I'm not going to go into too much of the research behind this, but I'd like to just il illustrate the concept just so that you follow why using low doses may not be sufficient for this. So uh, very basics of enzymes. I don't want to bore anyone with this. Essentially, an enzyme is simply a protein or some of the molecule which essentially is you're using uh, to enhance the rate at which you can convert A into B. A is molecule A and B is molecule B. And oftentimes you use a coenzyme or a cofactor, in this case thiamine, or in this case a, a vitamin or a mineral. Um, and what that does is it enhances the rate of reaction so that you can effectively do that in a timely manner. Now, all en enzymes have what are called uh, binding affinity, and this can be determined by lots of things. Sometimes people who have certain genetic um, predispositions, the enzymes that they make may have slightly less affinity, but ultimately um, the binding affinity is the rate at which you can bind with its respect cofactor okay now uh, if we look at the examples from genetic disorders of metabolism this is where i think we can apply this also to b1 because there are like i said people who have hereditary conditions where they make defective enzymes and what that means is is that the enzyme has a really low affinity for its respective cofactor it means it can't bind it very well examples of this are maple syrup urine disease 
uh, homocysteinuria, methyl malonic acidemia. These are kind of things that a medical geneticist would need to be dealing with, right? But what they found pretty early on when they were studying these, I mean, uh, back in the day, this would probably be in most cases a life-threatening situation and the kid would die, you know, probably within weeks, depending on the condition. Uh, these are usually fatal. Now with modern medicine and with genetics and things like that, we can test for this and actually find this, find this stuff out. And what they found is that many of these conditions, even though someone has poor enzyme uh, affinity, the, 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 the enzyme that they make doesn't have a very strong magnetic pull for its cofactor. Well, you can bypass this in the way that they bypass it, even in conventional medicine is by using extremely high doses of a nutrient. So an example would be if you have a uh, homocysteine urea, which is B6 responsive, they call it B6 responsive because it means that the B6 in your diet isn't enough to overcome that, that problem. But if you were to take high amounts, so sometimes they give these kids massive amounts, like five milligrams or you know 50 milligrams or 500 milligrams or something. I don't know exactly with B6, but, um, but they give them insane amounts. And what they find is that these kids actually regain normal function. So the enzyme, despite it not being able to bind with much, if you saturate the cell with massive amounts of it, it doesn't matter. It's like, it doesn't matter. You, you overcome that. It's like you, you kind of provide enough to mean that even though it doesn't have a very strong pull, there's so much of the nutrient to pull that it starts working normally. And so they find that enzymes, which can be super slow ordinarily, if you give them high amounts or you saturate them with high doses of a nutrient, you speed them up. Okay. So how might this apply to what we were looking at when it comes to neurodegeneration, when it comes to someone who's dealing with environmental toxicity, they're dealing with, um, and, and there's a lot of evidence that B1 responsive enzymes are inhibited by toxins. They are inhibited in certain conditions, namely Parkinson's, uh, but many others. So how, how can we take this concept and apply it to that? Well, although someone may not have the genes, they may be making a normal enzyme, but if it's blocked, if it's inactivated, we use the same principle and we give massive doses, massive doses. We're talking in the realm of 1,000 to sometimes 5,000 or even 6,000 times the RDA. And in many cases, that is necessary to achieve the effects of normalizing the process that wasn't working prior. So a way that some people with Parkinson's would be able to know that they're seeing improvement is, for instance, they may start on 1,000 milligrams per day of thiamine hydrochloride, and they don't see much benefit, and then they might go up and up. And there's even some research using like 4,000 milligrams, and I know several people use even more than that. I personally wouldn't go higher than that, but you know, you, you can you can be pretty liberal when it comes to this stuff. Uh, but overall, the way that they would know is that when they reach a certain dose or when they reach a certain threshold, um, most of the symptoms would would disappear or would would improve. You see the same in uh, chronic pain. And sometimes it is as though there is a threshold. And this is, is where it is super interesting. But again, um, this is something which, uh, yeah, I, I, haven't, I haven't spoken much about in this, this talk. Uh, but overall, just so that you have some, some things to go away with today, uh, I'm not saying that all testing is useless. I'm saying serum thiamine is generally not very effective um, and that there are other tests that can be used. And if you have a, 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 um, a group of tests, then that, that can come in handy. Uh, one of those is going to be thiamine pyrophosphate in the blood. That's whole blood. And that's usually uh, LabCorp that does that if you're based in the US. Transketolase, uh, if you can get it with the TPP effect, that's excellent. They do that in, in Europe. There's a company called uh, HDRI Labs. Um, they're also based in the US. You can get that. Uh, if you can just get the transketolase activity. Again, these are, this is what you're going you're gonna to be seeing. So if transketolase activity is low, it generally means that, that thiamine, um, thiamine is deficient at the level of the red blood cell. Thiamine pyrophosphate, again, if it's low, uh, but then again, reference ranges, there's inherent problems with those. I personally don't, I don't even do any testing anymore. I don't recommend that anyone does it uh, just because I found so many people. I've literally found hundreds and hundreds of people who had tested normal. And yet when they try thiamine, uh, it, it actually it, it helps, help, help, helps them. And so I kind of lost faith in, in testing in that respect. So I don't even recommend it. But if you're going to use it, uh, another marker that you might see is uh, elevated plasma alanine. Uh, on an amino acids panel. Now, there are different forms, and ultimately I haven't had time to put together diff the different forms, but just so that you know, uh, there are three main different types. You have the thiamine salts. That's mostly going to be what you're going to find in most of the research, but also in the shops that you go to. If you go to a health, health food store, or depending on which country you're in, most of it is going to either be thiamine hydrochloride or thiamine mononitrite. M mononitrite, sorry. So these generally have poor absorption, and because of that, it's estimated that you may only absorb anywhere from like five to 10%, depending on the form. Now that can be overcome to some extent by taking a massive dose at once. For instance, if you take like 2000 milligrams, then it's, it's thought that this activates passive transport in the gut and allows you to absorb more into the blood. Either way, you generally need much, much, much higher doses to achieve a clinical effect. And this even occurs when trying to address a deficiency. If you look at the literature, they are pretty liberal when it comes to the doses that they give uh, in terms of addressing a deficiency. And it is, it is known that you can... Um, 
it can take six months to a year for someone to fully recover. So don't expect things to change overnight, although for some people it will. Now, there's another form that you might have heard of. You may know it's called benfotiamin. Just so that you know, uh, and I'll, I'll put a little diagram in the next presentation so that you understand the, the, the structure of these molecules, but benfotiamin is just a thiamine molecule bound to uh, bound to another type of molecule, which essentially dissociates from it when it's absorbed into the system. And the reason why these, these molecules were synthesized they were all synthesized in Japan in the 1960s. The reason was was because of the poor absorption of thiamine salts. They needed to find ways to get thiamine into the system as quickly as possible. And the way that they did that was they attached thiamine, they, they, they attached different molecules to it, like sulfur groups. They looked at alithiamine, thiamine derived from garlic. They attached lots of different chemical um, uh, attachments to the thiamine molecule, and they, they eventually settled on like two main forms. One is benfotiamine, although the form that they use most frequently in Japan is actually called TTFD. Uh, another chemical name for that is thiamine. Now, this is, I personally find it to be the most effective, although it can evoke the most side effects, and that's something we'll talk about when we talk about more practical application of it. But Ultimately, these forms, uh, they are designed in such a way that they freely pass across the cell membrane barrier. You remember we were talking about how you have, when, 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 you, when, you, when you take thiamine and when you eat thiamine, you have these transporters on the gut, which it needs to get through and that's saturable. So when it's saturated, then you're not going to absorb anymore. And that's like an inbuilt mechanism to prevent your body from absorbing more thiamine than it's kind of designed to absorb. Whereas these special thiamine molecules they essentially, uh, easy way to think about it is they completely just melt through the cell membrane. They melt through the intestinal barrier. They melt through the cell, uh, the actual cell membrane barrier as well. So you don't need thiamine transporters at the cell level. And then some of them can even like melt into the mitochondria kind of thing. But Ultimately, uh, they're slightly different. TTFD is bound with a sulfur group, benfotiamin not. Um, generally, you for TTFD, there's there's really there's only two brands in the entire world, or the entire Western world that make it. There's um, there's uh, Ali, there's ecological formulas, and that's the brand is called Ali Thiamin. Uh, and then there's Objective Nutrients, which is my company. There's there's only two of us. Uh, you you can get it in Japan, and that's under a company called Takeda, and it's you can also find it as Ali Namin. But uh, I don't know I don't know if they ship to the Western world. For benfotiamin, that's been much more heavily researched in the West, um, and you can get there's lots of companies that sell that. Generally, you need much lower doses for when using benfot. You need much lower doses when using benfotiamin compared to thiamine HCL, but you need lower doses of TTFD compared with benfotiamin. So you need the least of TTFD, slightly more with benfotiamin, and you need the most with thiamine HCL. Now, uh, a slightly different form, but very similar to TTFD, is called solbutyamin. Solbutyamin is another disulfide derivative. It's bound with a sulfur group and essentially exerts very similar actions, although it does seem to have a strange kind of um, tolerance effect. So some people take it for its nootropic benefits, but they find as though uh, the effects wear off. Now, something to bear in mind is that when you're, if you are interested in using this therapy, what you really, really, really need to understand yourself, but also to educate your patients on, most importantly, is something called the paradoxical reaction. And I know it kind of sounds, uh, every, there's lots of people who say this about any therapy. They say, oh, you get worse before you get better. And that's generally a way in which, you know, they can kind of avoid having to come to terms with the fact that their therapy might not actually be working. It might might be making the person worse. Well, it, <laughs> it does seem genuine. It is true that most of the people who do see benefit from thiamine, they generally tend to get worse before they get better. And what I mean by that is that their original symptoms, which are co which is caused by thiamine deficiency in the first place, so say that's fatigue, dizziness, and constipation, sometimes what you will see is that those symptoms will get worse. Or one or two of those will get worse and another one will improve. So on this diagram, what I put is I've, 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 I've said here, like for instance, when you start thiamine supplementation, you get this temporary worsening of symptoms and then you get an improvement. And then that's when you reach this new baseline, around the time that you reach that new baseline is only the level when you increase the dose. So this, for this very reason, um, people are recommended to start very slowly. Okay. And so for instance, if you see that the therapeutic level is between like 500 and 2000 milligrams, you do not start someone on 500 milligrams. Like don't, because the chances are they'll take it. And if this is going to work for them, they will feel terrible. Like there's maybe 10 or 20% of people who don't feel terrible. They feel great. But the other 80% usually feel terrible or they, 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 feel a worsening of some symptoms. And it's usually proportional to the, um, the the severity of or the need that their body has. So if they are so severely deficient, or the longer that they've been in this state for, you know, if they're like a chronic fatigue syndrome patient of 10 years, 15 years, and they're used to this, then they're usually going to need to go much more slowly than someone who doesn't have that kind of health history. Um, and the severity of the reaction is also oftentimes proportional to the dose. So this is a good argument to start at a very, very, very low dose. In fact, you know, the capsules, uh, TTFD that my company makes, we make Thymax and the capsules are 100 milligrams. But honestly, 
everyone on my group, in my protocols, I, I say literally, you need to open up a capsule and take a sprinkle. You do not start with one capsule to start off with because the chances are you, it's going to put you off. And sometimes the symptoms are so severe that people are actually put off and they don't want to, they don't want to pursue the therapy. Even if you think it might work, it's going to be hard to convince them um, to, to carry on if it makes them feel so bad. So the key is start very low and start very slow. The way that you do it, basically this diagram, you start supplementation, very low dose, and then you notice there's a worsening of symptoms, right? So after the symptoms return back to baseline, so usually they'll see they'll see a worsening, but then they'll see a rebound effect. And that rebound effect will take them slightly higher. It means it'll feel slightly better than, than when they started. And when they feel slightly better, when they stick at that dose and they feel okay, then you increase the dose further. You do not increase the dose if someone is feeling worse. Okay. If they're still in that state where they've got all of these symptoms that are recurring or getting worse or anything like that, you do not increase the dose because it's, it's going to make the problem 10 times worse. Okay. You have to be very patient. And with some people, they can be on a, an extremely low dose for weeks, if not months. And they've very, very, very slowly gradually build up. So that's super important. Okay. Now there are nutritional interactions. I don't have time to go through this exactly today, but as it happens, I mean, logically you can understand why this would be when you take high doses of one nutrient off times. Uh, what seems to be the case is that it can increase the demand or the utilization of other nutrients. Perhaps that is, if it is restarting or kicking in energy metabolism or starting, uh, you know, building new material or whatever is happening. I don't think anyone really knows whatever is happening. Uh, it does seem as though some of those effects, this, this paradoxical reaction, these symptoms that get worse, uh, some of those can be, um, somewhat mitigated by providing other nutrients behind them. So for instance, if someone takes B1, then all of a sudden they start noticing that they get they might develop a dry, itchy skin on their face. They might develop eye pain or something like that. That's a key indication for riboflavin. So you want to make sure that they are taking riboflavin alongside the thiamine. Now, it can be pretty difficult to manage this. And for this reason, usually in 90% of people, it's going to be the best way to go about it is behind your thiamine supplement. So you choose a form of thiamine, you get them on that on a low dose, but behind that, just to cover all bases, and this is what Lonsdale uh, found as well through his career, was you just use a basic B-complex. Now, it's going to depend on your patient whether it's going to be methylated or non-methylated. Okay, Sometimes the methylated forms can um, trigger odd symptoms, make people feel a little bit jittery and anxious and things. So um, so yeah, generally, you're just going to start them on any kind of a B-complex. It doesn't have to be a high-dose one, just behind the B1. Now, as I was saying before, magnesium is also super important when taking thiamine. And sometimes those paradoxical reactions, so for instance, the feeling worse that someone has is actually just a magnesium deficiency. And it's because they take, take B1 and they're not taking magnesium behind it. And so what you find is that as they start on the magnesium, the symptoms go away and they, they don't have a paradoxical reaction anymore. It's ultimately just, um, it was just increasing that demand and they didn't have enough magnesium to, to meet that demand. So generally, three most important parts, low dose, thiamine, very slowly, additional B, B vitamin complex behind it, and magnesium. Now, sometimes you will also find that there's a greater need for other electrolytes. Lonsdale didn't speak much about this, but I have found in the past five years, I feel like potassium is really important. And I know that there is some medical justification for uh, a concern about taking potassium supplements. However, um, what you will find is that a low dose of potassium, maybe 500 milligrams, maximum 1,000, 2,000 milligrams taken spread out throughout the day can also very help to, can help to mitigate many of those uh, symptoms that someone gets when they start taking B1. Just to give some context, when someone is taking B1, uh, this concept of, of refeeding syndrome seems to be perhaps applicable to the paradoxical reaction in that uh, what seems to be occurring is that someone's body is, is essentially getting a shock. They're able to turn, turn from this kind of catabolic towards this anabolic state. And it does seem as though the rate at which electrolytes are used, particularly potassium, goes through the roof. And um, there is evidence that long-term thiamine deficiency does... Uh, cause a retention of sodium in cells uh, at the detriment of potassium. So cells, particularly in the heart, but also elsewhere, lose the ability to retain potassium. But when you treat them with thiamine, then they suck potassium up from the blood. And so what I think is happening, sometimes this can be verified by, by blood, blood testing as well, is that when someone begins repleting B1, when they've been so low for so long, their cells are basically crying out for it. It seems to suck up potassium from the blood because the cells can finally start kind of retaining it. And so it is useful. And if you don't want to use a potassium supplement, something I recommend is coconut water. It's generally very good. Some people also use cream of tartar. There's a couple of options, um, but just making sure that that is there available uh, can be super useful. Now, if you want an introduction to the concept of mega dosing B1 kind of beyond addressing deficiency, uh, this concept where we have this kind of equivalent biochemical situation, then uh, it would be definitely worth checking out. I've got this article here, mega dose thiamine beyond addressing deficiency on my website. I talk about the research, talk about the evidence. Uh, ideally in the next presentation, I'd like to 
flesh out the concept a little bit more so that you understand the justification from a research perspective, um, so that you also have the tools to know what the forms are, what the benefits of the forms are, when to use which form. I'll give you some examples of protocols and things that can be useful for these kind of conditions. Uh, if there's any particular kind of condition that you'd like to know about, for instance, if there's 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 things for Parkinson's that can be very useful. Um, but they're, they're, yeah, there's 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 a couple more things i'd like to add into this ultimately my my aim is that you guys have as much material and information so that if you see one of your patients or your clients who you think feel, you feel as though they might benefit from this that you have all the tools at your disposal to know or you know to feel confident trying it out and saying okay well i know that this does this and this person's presenting with this symptom so actually i, I think that they might benefit from this form and if they get these symptoms then actually you can try this nutrient or you can try this supplement or whatever that would be the you know the ultimate aim uh sorry if i've rambled on a lot i uh i guess that's that's finished um sorry i wasn't i didn't come more prepared but uh yeah that's that's yeah. everything for today